الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده وعلى آله والصحابة والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى قيام الساعة أما بعد Indeed our praises belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the one true creator and sustainer of the universe and we invoke his peace and blessings upon his messenger after whom there is no more messenger or prophet to come his family his companions and all those who follow them in righteousness until the hour is established my dear brothers and sisters in islam assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa in our previous discussions last week we spoke about the issue and in particular refuting the idea that the sunnah of the Prophet is not important. There are some who believe or claim that all we need is the Quran. We don't need the hadith. And Alhamdulillah, we have dealt with the details of this issue after which a person has to accept and agree that the sunnah is indispensable. We cannot do without the sunnah. Islam as a way of life, as a system that Allah revealed, cannot exist without the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. But there are some issues that are related to this issue as well. And uh, I would like to discuss some of them with you. Because I believe as Muslims, these are also important issues that we need to understand as we relate with the Quran and the Sunnah. Now, when a person looks at the discussion of whether or not the Sunnah is important in addition to the Quran, a person may come away with the idea that he or she can directly interpret the Quran and Sunnah on their own. Now this is a serious issue, a serious matter. And in as much as we need the Quran and the Sunnah, at the same time, individuals are not allowed to do their own private personal interpretation of the Quran and the Sunnah. So no one should take the Qur'an and just read the translation and start giving fatwa. Nor should they do the same with a hadith or two that they read. There are certain other knowledge, other disciplines, other issues that a person has to know about and understand before they begin to issue fatwas as we say. And this is why we need to also read what the scholars before have said about the particular <laughs> verse we're looking at or the hadith. These days it is wrong for anybody at any point in time, not only these days, to independently look at the Quran and the Sunnah without looking at the wealth of knowledge that the scholars before have left for us. Because this knowledge that the scholars have left, it has its importance and its role to play. Now, we will all agree as Muslims that the ultimate objective of the Muslim is to follow the Quran and the Sunnah. This is what Allah has obliged us to do in the Quran. Allah wa atiyyur Rasul, obey Allah and obey the Messenger. So this is the primary and ultimate objective of every Muslim, to get to the Qur'an and Sunnah. The thing is, brothers and sisters, many of us on our own, independently of this wealth of knowledge that was passed down to us, we cannot access the Qur'an and Sunnah. And so we need this knowledge of our scholars in the past, to help us get to the Qur'an and Sunnah. Although the answers or the fatwas that the scholars gave before, that is not the objective of the Muslim. We're not obliged to follow a particular scholar or madhab, we'll talk more about this issue later on. 
Are we obliged to follow the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? However, our scholars in the past were striving to do exactly the same thing. And so they have left for us, we have inherited from them their knowledge and their experiences and their understanding based on the context in which they lived. They have passed on to us their understanding of the Quran and the Sunnah. The same Quran and Sunnah we have today. But their knowledge is important because it ensures that our understanding of the verse or the hadith is correct and that we don't deviate and would not even realize it. So the knowledge before works as a check and balance to ensure that we're not misguided. Because looking at what they have said, if our ideas are, are contradictory, then of course that's problematic. What if the ideas we have today, when we look at the Qur'an or the Sunnah, is not necessarily contradictory, it, may, it perhaps may add to the wealth of knowledge, and Alhamdulillah, we know we're not sort of diverging, and that we're still on the same, heading in the same direction, although, MashaAllah, we're now able to add our contribution to this knowledge. So, the bottom line is, brothers and sisters, Muslims today should not feel that we don't need the scholars in the past. And I've heard people who've said this. When you look at the issue of fiqh and the differences of opinion on issues, and you start to deal with the, the, the evidence, the dalil of each opinion, and you start to look at, okay, this hadith is not, is not sahih, for example, there are people who say, you know what? It's the scholars in the past who have created all this division among the Muslims today. This is a very serious accusation. The scholars in the past have not created division. All they have done is to attempt to help the people of their time arrive at the Quran and Sunnah. It is you and I who have used this knowledge not to get us closer to the Quran and Sunnah, but to start fighting and divide ourselves even more. So it is sad to hear Muslims say, that the scholars are the ones who are responsible for the division of the Muslim Ummah. Actually, brothers and sisters, the differences of opinion that have been documented and recorded and passed down to us is a testament not only to the freedom of expression that Islam encourages among people, but also the freedom of thought that Islam encourages. So much so that there are many ideas that scholars have voiced. Many opinions that they have voiced that have been recorded and documented. Opinions, if you hear them, you will know that they're incorrect, subhanAllah. They're not valid. Yet the scholars did not throw these things out the window as we say. Why? Because Islam encourages freedom of thought and freedom of expression. So you can think it and you can voice it. Not because you are wrong, it means you shouldn't say it. And so as a result, what we find in fiqh is the recording of every opinion. And as I have said, some of them are so off mark that even you and I, average people, subhanAllah, we, as soon as we read it, we know this is wrong. Let me give you a quick example. al hafiz ibn Hajar, rahimahullah, in discussing the issue of Laylat al-Qadr based on the ahadith of Sahih al-Bukhari, because he did a sharh of Sahih al-Bukhari, in discussing the issue of Laylat al-Qadr, and in particular the issue of which night exactly is Laylat al-Qadr, he mentioned many opinions of the scholars. Let me just share with you one opinion that is documented and recorded and passed on from generation to generation, although we know with certainty that this opinion is wrong, it's incorrect. Among the opinions of the scholars regarding the pinpointing of Laylatul Qadr is the view of some scholars that Laylatul Qadr 
is not in the month of Ramadan only, it could be any other night in the year as well. The average Muslim would know that this is not correct. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and if we put these two verses together, the answer is very clear. Allah says, Inna anzalnahu fi laylatil qadr. We, Allah says, we've revealed it in the night of power. So the night of power is the revelation of the Qur'an. Then Allah says, Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an. Hudan lil nas. The month of Ramadan is the month in which the Qur'an was revealed. When we put these verses together, we, we realize and we learn that Laylatul Qadr must be in Ramadan. When you add to that the fact that the Prophet ﷺ in, in a number of authentic ahadith in Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, so these are ahadith that are agreed upon, muttafaq alayh. When we look at the statements of the Prophet and his own actions in terms of searching for Laylatul Qadr in Ramadan, we know for sure that Ram Laylatul Qadr is in Ramadan, no other month. Yet, there are scholars in the past who held such, a, such an opinion. The amazing thing is, the opinion is documented and recorded, and it is also, it has been passed down. So when the discussion comes up around this issue, this is an opinion that is mentioned. This is a testament, I believe, brothers and sisters, subhanAllah, to the level of freedom of thought and expression that Islam encourages. That an idea that is completely wrong is documented, recorded in the past, on, and it comes up in discussion. So no one should get away with the idea that we don't need the scholars of the past. We need them. We need to see and to understand how they understood the Quran and Sunnah to ensure that we don't go astray. In addition to that, we can certainly benefit from their experiences. But the thing is, brothers and sisters, that we must understand as Muslims, uh, today in our time, as we live now, and of course every era, every generation of Muslims ought to realize this. That every generation will have new experiences in life. And as such, we need to understand the Qur'an and the Sunnah in, context, in the context in which we live. Because we know that the Prophet ﷺ is the last and final Prophet and Messenger. This is what the Qur'an says. مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ مِنْ رِجَالِكُمْ وَلَكِنْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ وَخَاتَمَ النَّبِيِّينَ Muhammad is not the father of any man among you. However, he is the messenger of Allah and the seal or the last of the prophets. This is what the Quran says. And we believe that the Quran is the truth from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we believe that the Quran has no mistakes. So we believe that the Prophet السلام, must be the last and final prophet and messenger. There is absolutely no other messenger or prophet to come. As a result, the revelation that he received the Quran must also be the last one. Because if another revelation were to come, it would mean who, whomever it comes to would now be a prophet himself or a messenger. Because it is the coming, the sending of revelation, right? This is an act of commissioning someone as a prophet and messenger. And if the Qur'an is the final message, then it must be applicable for all times and all people. Or else, people, is, people are going to have an excuse. They will say, oh Lord, your message became outdated. It no longer applied. But you did not send a new one. So what were we supposed to follow? That which was outdated and, and, and not relevant, irrelevant to us, they would have an excuse. But Allah has ensured, brothers and sisters, that no one will have any such excuse or justification. So it must mean that the message of the Qur'an is such that it will never become outdated. It will always be applicable. What that means, brothers and sisters, is that the Muslims in every era or every generation 
will look look at the Quran, the same Quran that the Prophet ﷺ received. And they will learn or they will see certain lessons in these same verses that the generation before did not see. Why? Because we look at the Quran from the perspective of the context in which we live. Which also means, by the way, that we need to understand, brothers and sisters, that the Quran, and in particular the Sunnah, they came to teach us concepts or principles or values or lessons, if you want to call them that, that we need to learn. And it's these concepts and these principles that are important for us as Muslims. The literal how of how we do things may change from time to time. Especially when it comes to matters of everyday life. The ibadah, the ibadah, of course, we cannot change. So we can't add to Salat al-Fajr or take away from it. We pray two rakat only. And in these two rakat, the Imam recites aloud. We can't change this. So in the ibadah, we can't change it. We practice it as it was given to us. But when it comes to human life, alhamdulillah, things will change. As, as life evolves, things will change. So the literal way in which we do certain things might be very different from the way in which the Prophet ﷺ used to do them. But we do the same thing. That's what's important, the concept. Let me give you a quick example. The Prophet ﷺ, in a hadith in Sahih Muslim, he said that for every step a person takes to the masjid, is sadaqah for him. Kullu khatwa, every foot, every step you take walking to the masjid, is sadaqah for you. The question is, brothers and sisters, what happens if you drive in your car to the masjid, or you ride your bicycle? Do you or do you not get this blessing that the Prophet promised in the hadith? If you understand that the Prophet is teaching us certain concepts and principles, then you will realize that it doesn't matter how you get to the masjid. What is important is that you go to the masjid. So the Prophet did not come alayhi salam to teach us literally how to go to the masjid. If that were the case, then we would all be riding camels to the masjid, or horses, or donkeys, or walking. That's it. But the Prophet ﷺ came to teach us concepts and values and principles we ought to live by, regardless of how different our everyday life might become from his time. And if we understand this, then we realize, brothers and sisters, that indeed, the message of the Qur'an will not become outdated, will always be applicable. Because it's the concepts that are important, the concepts that will not change. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always wanted people to be kind and courteous. He wanted them to be compassionate and merciful, tolerant, helpful, caring. These are concepts that will never change, subhanAllah. At no time would Allah demand from people that they no longer care about the less fortunate in society. So it's the concepts that are important. The literal way of doing things may change from time to time. And so if we understand this, then we realize that indeed the message of the Quran will not become outdated. And that's why when we read the Quran, the concepts are the same that we learn like the previous generations. But the physical way of doing things might change. Today, mashallah, in our classrooms, we have chairs and desks for our students. We have all kinds of equipment, overhead projectors, full copiers. In the time of the Prophet, ﷺ, people used to sit in a masjid like you and I are sitting right now. There are people Alhamdulillah, they are few in number, who claim that these things are bid'ah. There is an Islamic institute in Guyana. And 
the brothers who teach in the institute are brothers who studied in Medina and graduated. Well, most of them, anyways. A few years ago, when I visited Guyana, I happened to speak to, uh, at that time, this brother, he also studied in Medina and graduated. He was the principal of the, the, the Islamic Institute in Guyana. And Guyana, by the way, is a little country in South America, kind of squeezed between Brazil and Venezuela. Um, so, and this, this brother was my friend because we studied together. And he told me about an incident that happened at the institute that he's the principal for at the time. He said that when the exam time came near, he happened to say, ask to say to the students, I hope you guys are preparing, all right? You get a week off of school. I hope you're using this time to prepare for the exams. <laughs> and he said the students told him, you know what? We're not going to do exams this year. So he said, what? You're not doing exams this year? They said, no. So he asked them why. They told him that one of the teachers told him that this is bid'ah. <laughs> the Prophet ﷺ never had examinations for the Sahaba. So they're not going to do exams. So he didn't teach them with desks and chairs even in his classroom. The thing is, brothers and sisters, the Prophet did not come to teach us literally how we should learn, whether we should sit on the ground or sit on a chair to learn. But what he taught us was the importance of learning. So whether you sit on the floor like you and I are, or you sit on a, uh, on a chair with a desk in front of you and the teacher uses all kinds of overhead projectors and so on, subhanAllah, it doesn't matter. As long as we learn, that's what's important. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. We will continue with this discussion. There are other issues related that I would like to cover with you and share with you. But may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of us and open up our hearts and minds so that we can understand the wonderful message he has revealed for mankind and may he inspire all of us to live by this message may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us firm on the straight path and may he forgive for us our mistakes and shortcomings aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh